What's good with the YouTube of Convict's Perspective? It's your boy Flacco coming live and direct with Senior Row with a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of energy, man. What's good with it? We got a banger for you guys right now. We're going to be touching base a little bit on street politics and how this, how issues on the streets occurs between different groups. And this is a particular group that you guys are going to be interested in. It talks about the Mongols, the Mexican Mafia, and the Hells Angel, man. I know a lot of you guys have been asking about the historical issues that have occurred between uh, the Mexican Mafia, the Hells Angels, as well as the Mongols, man. This article comes from a reliable source, man, who's done years of investigating. Um, it's well known as far as in the law enforcement field, man. And so we kind of thought, came across this article, man. And what interested us was the details of cycle of events that we've been able to confirm through other resources, man. So bro's going to get right to it, man. This whole article, it's not like normally the, the things that we read as far as indictments and stuff. This article goes into details and incidents, man. And you guys are going to enjoy this. Yeah, it's kind of it kind of starts off with a little bit of history and then kind of dives right into it, man. So I'm going to do the same. I'm going to dive right into it. And uh, it's about the Mongols, which are outlaw, outlaw motorcycle gang spawn in California. Their colors are black and white. And their three-piece patch features a Genghis Khan-type Mongol warrior riding a Harley-Davidson motorcycle in the center. The top rocker reads Mongols, but it is in third place. But it is in the third piece, the bottom rocker, that first caused the gang a problem. The Mongols have a California bottom rocker, and this fact was highly offensive to the Hells Angels outlaw motorcycle gang. The HA claimed dominion over California, its home state, and exclusive rights to the California bottom rocker. So they went to war. Outnumbered by the HAs from the very beginning, the Mongols formed alliances with the Hells Angels enemies. The big, bad to the bone, Hells Angels attempted to form a national association decades ago to place all other outlaw motorcycle gangs under their control. The OMGs, outlaw motorcycle gangs, that resisted this HA takeover formed loose alliances. The Outlaws Motorcycle Gang and the Vagos Motorcycle Gang were part of this resistance in California and eventually in the Southwestern United States. These outlaw gangs are not known for their adherence to truces and coalitions. When you deal with the devil, you can't expect honesty and fair play. The Mongols had already let the devil into the deal in the early 70s. The Hells Angels were racist and did not allow African Americans in their organization, and many also disdained Asian and Mexican Americans. But the Mongols were more tolerant and had accepted Hispanic and other members of color. When I worked in LASD, East Los Angeles Station, in 1974, Ernest Robert Salas was an officer in the San Gabriel chapter of the Mongols. His brother, Robert Robot Salas, was a notorious leader in the Mexican Mafia prison gang. These Mexican Mongols proved themselves in the wars with the Hells Angels and on the road in biker runs. The Mongols began bringing more and more of these Hispanics into the club. Because they needed more soldiers for the war against the Big Red Machine, by the 1990s, Mongols were recruiting former street gang members from both Northern and Southern California's prospects. Yep. Many new recruits did not own a bike or even know how to ride. The Mongol constitution insists on Harley Davidson ownership before a prospect can become a full-fledged member. But like in our own military, in a war of attrition with the Hells Angels, the Mongols lowered their standards and enlisted numerous lowrider Cholo street gang veterans. Yeah. Some of the East LA Vatos locals even became part of the Mongol Special Enforcer Squad, and they often wear a black and white LA Enforcer patch on the front of their cuts. However, many of them had been Southern California Hispanic street gang members, also known as Soreños, who had sworn allegiance to the Mexican Mafia prison gang, and that means a blood in, blood out commitment. In January of 2004, a group of Mongols met a group of members of the Bassett Grande Street Gang at a motel room in the city of Arcadia, NELA, also known as Northeast Los Angeles. The Mongols were there to buy meth wholesale, wholesale to sell retail. 
After the deal, the Bassett gang members invited the Mongols to party with them in the motel room they had used for the deal. The five or six Mongols were acting as security for the deal and first accompanied the drugs and their buyer back to a Mongol safe house nearby, but four of them returned to the Bassett party. One of the Mongol security team was a former member of LA's largest street gang, 18th Street. However, members of the Bassett gang soon recognized this Mongol as a former Sereno who was on the Mexican mafia's green light list. He had been placed on this hit list for breaking the Sereno code of conduct and that green light list is circulated throughout Southern California and especially committed to in every county jail and state prison. The Sereños were required by the Mexican Mafia to kill anyone on the list, if they could. When confronted by the Bassett gang, members of the Mongols went to the bathroom and came out wearing a pistol in plain view in his waistband. As a Mongol, he was always expected to represent the Mongols and stand up to these gang members. He refused to leave the party, counting on his fellow Mongols to back him up. Eventually, the Bassett gang members rushed him in force. In the struggle, the 18th Street Mongol was killed and another Mongol who stayed to fight was badly injured. Two other Mongols ran away. The Mongols would later hold court for those considered cowards for running and punish the two who ran. January 10, 2004, in the city of Rosemead in the San Gabriel Valley, members of the Sangra Sereno gang had set up a meth lab in a motel room and started doing business. During that same week, there was a Mongol motorcycle run going on and several Mongols had checked into the same motel. One Mongol from San Jose, Norteño, also area, walked past the open meth lab room and started asking questions. Over the next hour or so, several verbal confrontations occurred between the Mongol Norteño and the Sangra Sureños. The Sangra gang members became aware of the presence of the Los Angeles Deputy Sheriff's patrol units in the area and broke down the meth lab quickly and began loading the drugs and equipment into cars. Unconcerned by the Sangra gang warnings, the Mongol confronted the gang members again in the parking lot, claiming not only to be a Mongol, but a Norteño as well. The Sangra gang members shot and killed him. Responding deputies caught the fleeing suspect and seized much of the meth and equipment. <laughs> In March of 2004, the Mexican Mafia shot callers held a meeting with the local Sereno gangs and sent word to the Mongols that they felt disrespected <laughs> and that the Sereños had sustained over 20,000 damage in loss of drugs, revenue, and personal damages. The Mafia said that they would consider the Mongols as just another L.A. street gang. They ordered the Mongols to pay for the lost revenue. The Mexican Mafia warned that if they didn't, the Mongols would be on the green light list and all its members would be targeted for murder by the Sereños both in and out of custody. In April of 2004, the Mongols let it be known that they refused to pay this extortion to the MA. They even made a few threats of their own. A biker stopped next to a Mexican Mafia representative while he was driving his car stopped at a traffic light with family members as passengers. The biker leaned over and said to the window through the passenger window, see how easy it would be to hurt you or your family? He then sped away. A few weeks later, very near the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department Academy in the city of La Mirada, a man dressed in a black leather jacket and black helmet and visor parked his rice rocket, also known, preferred by a Japanese motorcycle, in the parking lot of a Mongol tattoo shop just before closing. He walked in, drew a pistol, and began firing at the people in the tattoo shop, killing the owner. The tattoo shop patron scrambled to return fire, but the shooter had already escaped on his rice rock. Dozens of Mongol members turned in their cuts and abandoned their Mongol membership. The green light was on the Mongols, and every Serenia was under orders to kill them on sight. All this was covered by my good friend, Los Angeles Fox 11 news reporter, Chris Blatchford, when he featured an unidentified Mongol shop caller interviewed in the silhouette on the Fox undercover news program. The station was contacted by a Mexican mafia representative who asked Blatchford to arrange a meeting between the two parties. 
The meeting was eventually made in a full-scale war. Full-scale war was averted. The M.A. Rice Rocket hitman was later identified and arrested, but the Mexican mafia suspected that the hitman might cooperate with law enforcement. He was also green-lighted by the M.A. The Sereno staged a full-fledged riot in the L.A. County Jail exercise yard as a distraction while they attempted to murder him. Deputy Javier Clift and several other deputies entered the riot fray to protect the victim from the Sereno assassins. The green-lighted Sereno was injured but not killed. Relationships between the Mongols and the Mexican Mafia and its army of Serenos have remained volatile. The Mafia is said to have made this request of the Mongols. Kill Doc, who, who was at the time the current Mongol president, and all will be forgiven. The Mongol president was already very unpopular with many Mongols because Doc was largely responsible for the recruitment of so many Serenio gang members into the Mongols and because of his failure to protect the then president Roger Piney at the infamous Laughlin, Nevada, Harris Casino shootout with the Hells Angels in 2002. It remains to be seen how all of this will play out. And this, this uh, like Flacco said, this is Richard Valdemir, retired sergeant, uh, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, 33 years, uh, gang enforcement. Um, he, very, very renowned. If you look into him, you'll find out that he's uh, a very sought after speaker as well as an expert in his field. You know, he knows this stuff, man. This is yeah. this is this is some banging information here, man. And it kind of it kind of corroborates everything we said about them recruiting <laughs> recruiting next Daniels and next North Daniels. You know I mean, I know in San Jose we had issues with them in two thousand five, bro. And actually, Dancing Bear, out of, out of all people, tried to send word for us to ease on back to kick on back, which which we responded. You know, what I mean, you don't run shit out here. You know, what I'm saying so. There's always. <laughs> There's always been some issues because they've been able to recruit, like they said, ex gang members, dropouts, yeah, people who leave the gang. And you know, the MA is not playing around. If you read, if you uh, if you listen to all parts of this article, man, I mean, I've heard, I've seen different comments. People say that maybe there was 21 Mongols killed, eight Mongols killed. I mean, I don't know the exact number, but I know the MA made a strong example over this incident. That's well established. That's well reported, man. And this isn't the only only time that they've had issues with uh, other gang members. I know there was an incident not that long ago, a few years back, in um, I want to say Los Banos, where two Mongols were killed by North Daniels. You know what I'm saying? I, I want to say I, I'm not precise, so don't. Someone out there is probably going to correct me, Matt, but I know I read an article about that, man. But anytime, this is where street politics come into play. Anytime you start recruiting or you start aligning to other group groups, when you have one of the big three or big big three that's out there that's representing and your racial relationships or past are associated with that, these are the consequences for the actions. You know I mean, this is what occurs. These are street politics. These are not prison politics. These are street politics being applied by prison organizations. Yeah, no doubt. You know, the, the thing is, is man, when you control the, the jails and the prisons as strongly as they do in their areas, and, and as well as well as the, the gentleman from up north as well, you know, you're doing dirt out in the streets. Eventually, dirt leads to being locked up. You know what I mean? And if you got issues with people on the streets, both of them groups are extremely dominant in their respective areas. And when you got to go do your time and whatever, you 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 got to run by them dudes. You know what I mean? And you. you <laughs> you're not going to win inside of an institution against either group. They're too well-established. They're too, they're dominant. I mean, no matter what you are on the streets, you could be whoever you want to be. You come to the California Department of Corrections, you're going to fall, you're going to fall into place or you're going to lock up. They're, those are the only two options, straight up. You know what, Rojo, I got a question for you, right? The one thing in this article that stands out to me the most is that when they talk about Chris Blatchford, who's a well-renowned reporter, author, and all that, right? Where he was the go-between between a Mexican mafia representative and a Mongol to, to defuse the war. The NF would never have allowed that to happen. Never. No. I don't, I don't know if times have changed where those doors would be open now, but you would never let a civilian into your business, let alone a reporter. Right. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah, because nothing's nothing sacred when you talk to them people. They could run, they could decide it's a story, you know. I mean, that's just different, man. I mean, you look at you look at the whole the fallout behind that movie American Me. They they reached out to Danny Trejo to get in touch with fucking almost. You know what I mean? It's they 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 just operate different. I mean, I'm not saying the way they operate is better or worse or anything like that at all. They just have a different set of of, of you know guidelines and procedures that they use that northerners don't you know it works so they got a long reach they made their point that's the, that's the key thing to the story man is yeah. is they get a prime example man you know I mean like money's old you better kick in you know I mean you jeopardize this you're, we want doc dead you know all will be forgiven you know what i mean i don't know i don't know how i don't know the backstory about how he left that that particular club you know what i'm saying yeah. but i do he's no longer part of that club no more we know that we know that he did, in fact, tell afterwards as well. So it's kind of an interesting backstory that maybe, I don't know, I don't try to get into, like, their type of politics, their type of groups. I mean, whatever you want to call them, you want to call them a 1% or a gang, a club, whatever or not, they all operate different, man. But this backstory to this issue, man, it just goes to show that, you know I mean, street politics, just because you think you may be safe out there, if you align with different groups and you try to go against a bigger group like one of these main organizations, there's going to be consequences to pay. People don't forget. You're going to be held accountable. You yeah, know? you know it's a trip too, bro. As I had heard, I don't remember the number specifically, but I read something about you know the the the, the brief Mongol, you know, uh, dispute with them gentlemen from down south, and and in the short amount of time that they were going at it, they lost more people than their whole three decade war they have going on with the HA and it was by a significant amount of people like double digits you know what I mean that's how quick that that, that turned into a, a, a nightmare <laughs> you know what I mean but that's exactly what the article says man is they, yeah. they start recruiting ex game members yeah and I remember we were hearing the same thing they were recruiting ex North Daniels out there ex, ex NR members you know what I mean ex bros that dropped out that debriefed you know what I mean they were recruiting those individuals out there man so they were high on our radar I mean, there was a point to where they were targets for us out there in the streets. You know what I mean, in addition to our loose lo loose relationship that we we've always had with Red and Mike out there in the streets, yeah, we've always been loose. But it's you know, what I mean, they can kind of wiggle and do what they do. I mean, it's nor it's not an organizational relationship. It's individuals within that, that that group that you may associate with. That's how a lot of these, these these interactions occur. And the same thing could be said about this this MC club is, it may not be the MC club in general. I'm saying all chapters or whatever that are doing business with them, but it could be some individuals that decide to within that group. Therefore, you got to remember if you're if you're part of a group and your actions are always going to reflect what you're doing, it could have severe consequences, just like in this case, man. Hey, personally, I've I've done business with the with the red and white gentlemen, you know, personally and as as well as when you know I was uh you know knee deep in politics, you know. I've never had any relations with them other guys, you know, so I don't know, man. I mean, they're, they're dominant forces in what they do and, and they're, we'll call it a niche, you know what I mean? But the, the thing about, you know, doing dirt, you know, whether they consider themselves a club or whatever, because I one of them got mad at me for calling them a gang. It's like, I, I don't mean no disrespect. I, I just call it like I see it. You know what I mean? If, if you're doing criminal stuff and there's a group of you, to me, I consider it a gang. I don't mean that as a, no disrespect at all for any time that I say that about anybody's group. I'll, I'll try to remember to say club, you know what I mean? And I don't mean no offense, but uh, you you can dominate a certain area for a certain time frame, man. But when you do that dirt and then you got to go, you're going to go to jail sooner or later. I mean, it's, it's going to be 90 something percent of your group is going to go to jail at some point or another. And that that's, <laughs> that's not somewhere where you have any power. Well, it just goes to show, though, the, th the key thing I see from this article, right, and it's it's corroborated because that's the same story that we heard. We had issues with them out there in San Jose. You know what I'm saying? We didn't want them out there. If we seen them, it was basically a green light for a while out there. Now, I mean, those are facts. You know what I'm saying? Is in times of war and attrition, you're going to recruit whatever resources or manpower that you have. Yeah. They dived into the streets, dived into individuals that were no longer active. You know what I'm saying? In the prison politics. And found gave them a home, all for recruiting recruiting numbers. 
what I'm saying? So yeah. I thought it was kind of key to this article, man. I mean, I don't personally know too many of them. Like I said, I got no issues but personally. I don't, I could care less. You know what I'm saying? I just know from an active standpoint, when I was active, we had existing issues because of the same damn thing they were doing down south is the same thing that they were doing up north. Right. Things may have changed now, the direction of where they've gone. You know what I'm saying? Therefore, their behavior is a little bit better when it comes to politics. I know there was a recent issue a couple of years ago where t- I think two of them were uh, uh, whacked by some North Daniels or maybe vice versa, man. Someone, someone correct me in the comments, man. I know it happened out there in Los Banos, but I know I caught wind of it. So there's always going to be personal issues, man. And, you know, the street, street politics are about this. It's the same thing as prison politics. There's ego. There's conflict. There's a, there's, there's a, uh, a play for power. You know what I'm saying? Where there's territory and where there's money, you're going to have conflict. And if you step on anybody's toes, there's going to be consequences. This is a prime example of that. You know, one thing I don't quite understand, man, is why, like, uh, you know, the, the motorcycle groups, especially like four or five of them are very powerful. I don't understand what would make them target people who, let's just call it failed, for lack of a better word, whether right or wrong, their fault, anybody's fault, in other organizations, such as be it down south, be it up north, why would they? Why would they even be considered for membership if they already have, a, you know, kind of a dark spot on their their resume as as a, a gangster? Well, that, you know, I mean, it depends how they sell it, though, too. That dark resume may have been they were forced out for politics, or they didn't want to pay this, or they felt no loyalty. You know what I'm saying there's betrayal and corruption in that lifestyle. One hundred percent. If you sell yourself that this is why I'm, I'm no longer with them, there may be a whole other group that's going to be receptive. Like, come on, we'll give you a home. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that makes sense, man. Hey, who's to say these people weren't already active and they got pulled away from their gang into this group? Right. You know what I'm saying? Money talks. That would be, that would also be like, you know, where your loyalties lie too, though. I mean, that should be a red flag as well. Like, oh, well, you know, you need that instant gratification and you're really willing to jump ship right now. But that's all we see. That's all we've seen this whole time through these organizations. It's all about the money, money and power. And if you can go from one group to where you're just a, a, a local street gang member, never sits to any position, right? And you're given a new type of authority, a new type of feeling, and a new type of life, they may gravitate towards that. They might they might like that whole biker scene. They may be trolls that secretly want to ride that Harley. You know what I'm saying? No doubt. Yeah, yeah. It could have been something burning in the back of their mind for years. Yeah. I mean, I don't really know the backstory, but I just know that I just know from this is something I can personally, ex- like I said, experience the scene because we had conflict and issues without them. And they pretty much were not going to show up anywhere where we were at. You know what I'm saying? As well as we had, a, like I said, a loose relationship on some business things that were going on with Red and White at that time. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean, I, I may be a little bit more, how you say it? I may be a little bit more biased in my thinking because my past relationships were never positive. You know what I'm saying? But like I said, today, I'm neither active or inactive. I think, you know what I mean? You know, if if you're going to be doing crime out there and pushing a negative agenda, man, you're going to reap, reap the consequences for those actions, period. No doubt. Yeah, whether it's by other gangsters or by police, no doubt, 100%. Real talk. Right on YouTube, man. Uh, yeah, Flacco brought this story to my attention, man, and we both real, realized, man, it'd be good, you know, especially with – in light of everything that's been going on in the in the in the motorcycle community, because everybody knows that there was a conflict between the MA and the Mongols. Not everybody out there knows the details behind it. This gives you a little bit of details of what really occurred and what happened. Yeah, and I'm sure there's a whole bigger backstory to this, and there's other people that were killed and other conflicts of, of pushing up on territories, man. But this gives you a little insight of yep. issues that occurred. Yeah, we thought that would be a good one, man. Well, with that said, I think that wraps that one up, man. Uh, appreciate you guys, man. And uh, maybe your boy will jump on live in a little bit, man. Have a good rest of your day. We'll holler at you.